Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zinger show with I, your host Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 553. That's 553 of the Agostino Zinger show with I, your host Agostino Zinger. Hope you're doing well wherever this show may find you wherever it may find you my hair's looking nuts in this camera right now but it is what it is if you listen via the audio version of the podcast you have no idea what i'm talking about and i'm so happy that is the case because right now man's looking like i've got jumanji living on my head and no that's not a joe rogan joke that's a joke that i made up all by myself using my whatever brain source i have left you know that's the one i made by myself but yeah here we are back again in the sector we're doing well i am hydrating as per usual part of my gallon water i need to drink per day bloody hell man absolutely hate and detest drinking water because it then makes you have to piss like an absolute elephant every single time and my word is there anything more annoying than having to go for a piss every single time don't get me wrong if i had to pick between going for a piss and going for a number two i'd pick up piss all day long because there's nothing worse than getting a runs and having to sit on a toilet for ages then as you get back up again you feel your stomach blah, 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 then you have to go back again no one loves that but the pissing thing oh jesus man it's horrible and who wants to be a grown ass adult like i am and be pissing up a tree or pissing around the back of a phone box or pissing in the dark alley somewhere i'm not that age anymore i remember there was a time when i was younger where i would just be pissing on a tree because obviously i'd be out drinking getting on it doing my thing and you just you know you pull out your little ding ding and you start pissing nowadays you do that you look you legitimately look like a kitty diddler do you know what i mean someone might walk past you and scream they might call the police if they see you with your flipping pants around your ankles or your knees as you're pissing on the street why would you have your pants on your ankles around your knees when you're pissing on the street i don't know stuff happens you've seen people outdoors you've seen how people get down i have no idea i'm not making any more comment i don't get myself cancelled but yeah um Oh, I, have, I hate it. I legitimately hate the fact that I have to piss so often. It really is driving me up the wall. But, you know, um, I guess it's good for weight loss. You know, if you want to um, keep yourself hydrated, you know, get rid of all that water weight, cleanse your system, whatever the benefits are. I'm just following it. I'm doing 75 hard still. Obviously, I told you before that I restarted day one. So I'm now on day six. No, I think day seven are actually. So that's going to be pushing things back a bit. But, you know, it doesn't matter. At least I'm doing it right and the correct way. So far, it's been okay. Not too bothersome and i honestly thought the two workouts a day would be the thing that would kill me but it's mostly been the water <laughs> honestly forgetting and or having to drink it really quickly before 12 it's just horrible that's why i had to stop at day 15 or whatnot because i've lasted when i last did a run because when i lasted the yeah the first time i attempted to do it because i just forgot to drink the water and i didn't want to continue on without drinking the water so here's to drinking water and remembering to drink gallons and gallons of it it's not easy man it's not easy but what else has been going on not much in it i downloaded house of gucci that's out now at the moment on all the regular spots where you get movies from wink wink so i'm probably gonna watch that over the weekend i'm kind of glad i didn't get a chance to watch it in cinema maybe i could still check it actually i'm gonna double check actually see if anywhere is showing it maybe they are showing it in like one of those kind of posh cinemas to go and check it out because it it is a movie that you probably should go out to see instead of being at home on your laptop because if there's anything if there's a way to ruin the movie going experience is to tell people to watch stuff on their laptop i don't know how film buffs or film reviewers do it where they get sent screeners because that's what they get right if you're a film reviewer you get sent a screener usually with your name watermarked across the screen or maybe on the cd or whatever right but it's usually a screener you get sent that you can basically watch at home but i wonder i guess if you're a film buff proper you're most likely going to have a pretty decent kind of cinema home cinema setup right you probably will do even if, if it's a projector you have on your wall or some fancy flat screen tv you're not going to be streaming it off your macbook air i would imagine you won't be but you know strange things have happened i guess but yeah that's what i'm going to do for the weekend probably that and of course subject myself to watching united play football oh and also going out yeah that's it what's happening on this weekend good jansen's playing at um in fabric actually so that should be a pretty decent night i'm looking forward to that one um i've kind of fallen back in love with fabric well i never really fell in love with it in the first place um i always had terrible times there but i usually went with quite decent groups of friends to see to old kind of like you know drum and bass nights which weirdly enough drum and bass is now coming back in vogue again i saw a friend of a friend online uploading a video of herself in a party happened over the weekend i think it was something called like 
holiday or something or whatever or garage i forgot what it was called some event happened this past weekend in london and a friend of a friend uploaded up the video with like a ca caption basically gushing over the party saying how amazing it was it reminded her of the old days blah 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 and the video clip itself i saw loads of really really young kids like you know rosy cheeks and all wearing all the cool all the cool clothes all the young kids wear. i was like wow there's a whole new generation of people kids coming up who legitimately don't mind listening to drum and bass because for whatever reason bass and you know even though people say what they say they say drum and bass is like the white version of jungle which is hilarious but i know a lot of kids coming up were listening to bass music which is kind of like the best way to describe it would be like hip-hop influenced or trap influenced kind of drum and bass music um so you get a lot of kind of samples of like very popular art hip-hop tracks being kind of mixed into just your quintessential drum and beat productions and that was the thing i saw a lot of kids kind of gravitating to but it's quite cool to see them really getting on top of or being involved with or inspired by the old school drum and bass movement from back in the day because that was a that was a real good time to be alive um, especially in London so many great clubs so many great nights so many careers we saw kind of from the start to the finish you know even though screams turned into a little bit of a flipping whiny baby online um scream and Bengal were a great duo back in the day back to back seeing them playing different venues seeing them evolve as people as djs is pretty cool to see so yeah more power to those guys so you're gonna see Godi Anton in fabric looking forward to that um you know it's turned into one of my better clubs to go to especially if you just want to do a bit of a sober rave there is good seating around there. The sound system's amazing. You can find little corners to just kind of listen to the music and zone out and not have to like get involved in all the hustle and bustle on the dance floor. If you do want to go and dance, the dance floor sick. They've got that upper stage bit towards the back of the main room that everyone stands on and tries to look cool. The second room's flipping awesome. The third room upstairs is really cool. Um, even the security guards are really overbearing and they search you way too deeply in a, at the start when you get in once you do get in or if you got a bit of trouble they are quite cool in terms of helping you out um i saw a guy collapse there once <laughs> probably taking too much ketamine and they looked after him really well there was medics on board on hand sorry to kind of help him and his um girlfriend uh, who was kind of panicking and screaming at the time but they did a really good job to kind of calm her down and sort out the situation from what i could see and keep the party going basically so yeah big fan of it if anything anything i'm not a fan of a slight concern to make sense of the venue but the fact that they give you drinks in plastic cups and shit it's like ugh, it's gross as hell you're paying like 10 quid for a mixer and you get it in a plastic cup it's like come on man do me a favor but anyway what can you do let's move on so topic one to get into quite a hilarious one i think in my opinion especially when you consider everything that's been happening for whatever reason um our prime minister here boris johnson has been able to kind of avoid um any kind of cause to quit or to step down off the back of this you know new report that was being put together about loads of parties happening at number 10 during the time that we we're in lockdown and during the time that the government were telling us that if you have a party you're going to get arrested you're going to get fined so essentially these guys are doing everything opposite to what they were telling us to do and for whatever reason um they didn't see anything wrong with it they just carried on blah 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 and there's banking the report now the report's been a bit flimsy there's not much detail to it people are arguing they're calling for boris johnson to step down and he just refuses to do so he's obviously you know Tef teflon boris or boris teflon whatever you want to say <clears throat> and it got me thinking about whether or not there are some you know obviously uh, mps within the conservative party who genuinely respect the fact that boris is so like lacks any self-awareness doesn't have the ability to have doesn't have the ability to feel shame or embarrassment and just keeps trucking because in most people's lives especially if you're a public figure i don't know if that's even true to say i'd say most people's life especially if you're a public figure shame is one of the things that kind of dictates how you do your moves but maybe the truth is if you want to be really successful as a public figure as a celebrity or whatever entertainer the actual real cheat code is to never ever ever have is to yeah the real cheat code is to basically numb yourself from having any sense of shame like just don't have it if you have no shame you win because shame allows you no shame allows you to do things that most sensible people wouldn't do because it's embarrassing because it makes them look bad because what people say because if you have no shame you probably don't care what people say about you either it just water for ducks bag and if you think about it if there's one person who doesn't 
get affected by what people say about him is Boris, right? He looks horrible. He's, you know, he's a blob. His face is melting, you know, whatever, right? There's so many things you could say about the guy, but he clearly doesn't care what you have to say um, because he obviously just keeps on moving. So maybe people in a conservative party, especially MPs, might secretly respect the fact that he's so resilient and that's why a lot of them aren't really kind of running or falling over themselves to basically put in votes of no confidence maybe that's the thing i don't know anyway one of the defenses that he made in the houses of parliament just on the on the thing on the day past the part sure report got released he basically um threw out a little bit of a conspiracy theory bone out there for all the rabid conspiracy theories out there in the uk about keir starmer the late the leader of the labor party supposedly um being involved in the cover-up or the look the other way of the jimmy savile case right and I don't know if this is true. There might be some truth to it. There might not be some truth to it. I don't really know. But the fact that Boris Johnson was facing all these calls to quit and shameful and, you know, um, going basically going against his own world, lying about the parties, not acknowledging his fault, refusing to say sorry until the last moment, blah, blah, blah. In defense, the first thing he does is point to somebody else in a brutal case of whataboutism, but basically saying, yeah, okay, if I'm bad, how bad are you then for turning the blind, for turning the other way and not prosecuting flipping Jeremy Savile when you had the opportunity to? And for whatever reason, people latched onto it, I guess maybe because there's truth to it, I don't really know about this conspiracy theory at all. And Keir Starmer then on the way to the House of Parliament was accosted by a mob of people I, I guess claiming to be conspiracy theorists who maybe I guess they, they would probably be a mixture of people who aren't happy with the direction Labour are going in and feel as if Keir Starmer isn't really a valid um, opposition to Boris Johnson because let's be honest as bad as Boris Johnson is as a Prime Minister there's no denying if Labour were in charge especially in the UK we would still be in lockdown we'd be like how they are in Canada how they are in Australia New Zealand even like well, France is coming out of it but we that, that's how we'd be like. we'd be like how they are in parts of Germany that's exactly how we'd be so we actually have a weird debt to we have we kind of oddly have to thank the conservative party for being so blase fay and blase about covid and kind of treating all the precautions as an afterthought um not taking the measures seriously um because essentially now we know why they didn't take it seriously because in their own lives they weren't taking it seriously but anyway kiss um Headline here comes to BBC, two arrested after protesters surrounded the Labour leader on his way to the office. And I think there's a little clip here actually of people kind of ravaging him. This is from Sky News. Let me see if I can play this. Yeah. leader of the opposition. Why aren't you opposing the government? Ugly scenes at the heart of Westminster. As Sir Keir Starmer was confronted by a mob outside Parliament and subjected to a barrage of insults. Hold on, Keir Starmer's a sir. When did he become a sir and why did he get a knighthood? They're just throwing these about for nothing, innit? What has he done to deserve a knighthood? God damn. Protesters shouted traitor and accused the Labour leader of protecting paedophiles by not prosecuting <laughs> Jimmy Savile when he was director of public prosecutions. <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson has faced calls from MPs to apologise for accusing Sir Keir last week of failing to prosecute Savile. This leader of the opposition, a former director of public prosecutions, Mr Speaker, very great. he spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile, as far as I can make out. That prompted the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, to declare he would not have made the remark and the resignation of one of the PM's closest aides, Policy Chief Manira Mirza. Sir Keir was walking back to Parliament with the Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy after they attended a briefing on Ukraine at the Ministry of Defence. It's a walk of barely a couple of hundred yards, but that was still enough for the mob to surround the two politicians. It wasn't really a mob, it was like... 10 15 people they need to relax responding to the intimidation of sir Keir, the pm tweeted the behavior directed at the leader of the opposition tonight is absolutely disgraceful <laughs> all forms of harassment of our elected representatives are completely unacceptable what a cunt he caused this right he fucking caused this he set the walls on him indirectly directly whatever this is like you know what um youtubers do when YouTubers are like um trying to get at someone they don't like or maybe doing a, 
a video on somebody they're not really fans of or exposing somebody they'll use you for a, a little disclaimer like hey none of my fans go and harass this person don't give them what they want don't kind of take away our point you know that that kind of like um, disclaimer before the video starts that's what they usually do so even youtubers can do it to people that they clearly dislike or people that they have no affinity to people that have been basically trying to you know uh rob them of their flipping livelihood why can't he do the same be like you know what i messed up please don't harass him this is a comment said in a, in, a, in the heat of the moment to political opponents trying to gain an advantage i don't know make up something my man just says <laughs> he <laughs> all forms of harassment of elected representative are completely acceptable mate you started it <laughs> oh horrible horrible person but yeah big up Keir Starmer I didn't know he was a flipping sir big up Boris Johnson I guess in some extent um really really crazy time to be alive in it interesting that the prime minister is not a sir but the leader of your Labour Party is who clearly is never going to get elected as prime minister that's never going to happen I don't think um well yeah I just don't see it especially beating anyone conservative he just doesn't have the minerals to do so and I think the country is a lot more splintered than what people lead it to believe or what the media tells you to believe but yeah fucking crazy in it absolutely nuts man these people these are bloody people so yeah boris is gonna survive until the end of time <clears throat> so i want to talk about this one this is a pretty interesting topic to speak about here this is another clip from the dvs interview dvs one interview that i mentioned in a podcast the other day and this one is specifically him kind of um sharing his thoughts on the need for local djs resident djs in the face of the pandemic right or in light or because of the pandemic because of, yeah because of the pandemic i've i've been on this channel plenty of times moaning at the fact that for the most part we don't really have a cohesive i say cohesive we don't really have any sort of residency culture here in the uk for the most part maybe some cities or towns outside of uk might have them but in london especially they've always kind of focused on big name djs from you know markets outside of the uk to come in and sell tickets and fill spaces or fill clubs whatnot and then the resident dj who would wouldn't be sometimes listed on the flipping flyer would just be the person that would do the opening um sets or the closing sets right when literally everyone left because they went to see the peak set at flipping one two or two or whatnot so there was never really an kind of an infrastructure in place to cultivate or build the careers of these djs to a point where they could sometimes maybe get the opportunity to play those headlining slots too in case something went wrong or just for a little bit of a refresh to break up the monotony of having the same old big ticket people playing because you know as great as it is to live in london and have a really vibrant clubbing scene it does get a bit stale it does get a bit repetitive seeing the same you know 10 20 people playing in the same clubs rotating every single weekend or every single month you just want to see some new fresh talent but obviously in the last few years there's been a real kind of i feel like renaissance in people especially younger kids deciding to throw all these different types of club nights from the infernos to the gutterings to the pussy palaces to the origins there's all these really cool club nights happening in different locations all over london that are really geared towards promoting and maybe bringing in new especially even orange is a good example origins has a lot of really big name djs playing i think the re the new one coming up is going to be like dr rubenstein sam freddie k but they always pepper those lineups with residents too to do the opening sets or sometimes do the closing sets so you get a good mixture but i feel like other places just haven't done that at all and ironically enough the pandemic forced most of these clubs that were resistant or hesitant or unwilling to have resident djs to basically hire them or put in some sort of program because for the foreseeable future the ability to move freely around europe or even to come to the uk isn't going to be the same as it was pre-pandemic so they have to do something and because you know there's less attendance now these clubs too they can maybe risk a little bit more because they don't really have to try and fill it up or to try and get those crazy Ricardo Villalobos numbers because no one's really getting those numbers anymore. No nights are really selling out as well as they were pre-pandemic. I've kind of always said, I feel like we took advantage or no, I feel like in general, people within the hospitality, oh, yeah, people within the nightlife scene in general, operators, people that own clubs, people that 
program club nights people that throw on events DJs themselves I think we all um, took for granted the kind of general consumer the average everyday punter who maybe goes out once a month once every two months and those people I feel like were the necessary part of clubbing scene here in the UK they filled out a lot of these venues and then especially when you add on top of those people tourists as well coming in and without them now we've seen clubs for the most part mostly em not also empty but not as full as they once were which is a good thing because it means everyone that's going out is probably on about the music but in general because of that lack of kind of capacity and lack of fullness i feel like clubs in general are willing to take more chances because it's not as if you're going to get back it out anyway even if you do big book doctor sorry even if you do book um dj harvey it's not like you're going to fill it out there's still kind of the opportunity to maybe try some new things so yeah uh what's his face devious one spoke about it here on this clip i'm going to quickly get it up on here so you can see i think it's like 1103 speaks about it Let's get it up on there quickly. No, there, there, there. Okay, it's about here. So this is Devious One talking about the need for local DJs and residency culture and stuff. But you know, one of the first things I said in the in the beginning of the pandemic uh, for our, our friend Steve in Minneapolis even was um, I did this interview with him and I said, I really hope that one thing that comes from the pandemic is that we find more amazing locals and local scenes and build local scenes. As much as I love being a headliner and I love being a guest and I love being booked to come places like this, I really wish you guys would have absolutely success without me. You know, like have 500 or a thousand people come to every event you do, even if it's just locals, because to me that would be amazing. And like that's how Minneapolis actually survives and what makes my hometown work. We don't need guests. We can get three to 500 people to come to any techno show just with locals. And I think that's something special. And the world now with like, with how popular techno and house is, in bigger cities, promoters get stuck competing with, I, we have to book a guest because this promoter books a guest and the crowds don't pay attention. But I, I hope, I hope with some of the downtime that Europe is having, that other cities can grow some attention for themselves. Yeah. I made it back. Well, and I think we are definitely seeing that. We're definitely seeing uh, a renaissance or a re-emergence of residency culture here in the UK. I think, like I mentioned, there's so many great alternative nights that aren't essentially catered towards kind of mainstream audiences that are really catered towards very specific niches from the crossbreeds of the world to the infernos of the world. They really speak to a particular crowd and people are eating it up, literally eating it up. And the good thing as well that I like about it too is that these place these nights or these kind of you know experiences that you go to they aren't just kind of relegated to like dingy warehouse spaces in the middle of nowhere they're putting these parties on in the same venues that you go to see your big ticket djs at e1 the fabrics the folds the corsica studios all these kind of established venues in london that usually host all the biggest DJs in the world are also hosting these really avant-garde forward-thinking club nights that are really pushing the kind of boundaries of what a club night is meant to be and it's great to see but it needs to be more like myself you know being a dj myself having been doing it for what 10 plus years now putting on my own nights and stuff and now kind of focusing more on trying to build up my sort of dj career i've noticed that unfortunately the only way for me to kind of get better and to be able to progress my career forward is by give but get be given a chance to play in those kind of spots or in those kind of places in those kind of clubs that i mentioned as a resident to basically fill in some spots here and there when bigger people come in the hope that maybe i can catch the attention of somebody a promoter somebody doing another an event a booking agency whatever that would then kind of take me on to bigger and better things in terms of maybe progressing my career but without that it's literally impossible to kind of progress your career unless you want to do the cheat way which is basically throw your own party and book yourself but again just to have a career as a dj you have to book your, you know you have to kind of make your own party um try and see if that works promoting a party is very very difficult especially nowadays with the abundance of events on there's no guarantee your event's going to be a success but again there's no guarantee you're going to be a success in the residency program but it does it's kind of like a weird school education that you do get in i, I don't know it's, a, it's an unfortunate thing because there is no perfect solution right the truth of the matter is there's way more DJs in London, you know, per square inch than there are probably clubs, right? There's just too many and there's not enough kind of spaces to go around. Cool. 
and then the other thing also is that does the does the the are the other cold heart reality of it are the customers or the punters really open and ready and receptive to just going out randomly to night tales and just seeing who's playing there or are they only going there specifically after 9 p.m because a certain dj is playing i don't really know i think for as much as people like to say let's promote underground artists i don't think the customers are really ready for really ready to kind of commit to giving up a weekend or a day a night to just a random person they've never heard because it's too expensive to go out basically there's you know maybe that's the reason why clubbing culture in parts of like you know places like berlin is so vibrant and other places in central europe because the entry tickets are so cheap and the nights out are so cheap too you're not spending on average 100 pound every time you walk into a club i guess in in london specifically if you go into a nightclub not including your drugs not including anything else you might take in there you might end up spending a hundred pounds from your ticket to your drinks to the cloakroom to maybe an uber back you're already spending a hundred pounds just going into that place so is it really is it really um, realistic to expect somebody to just you know trust that this place programming is going to be good and that they're going to have a good time um despite them not knowing who's playing on the lineup i don't really know but i would like to see more places take more chances um because i do think it's necessary i think if we don't start now when are we ever going to start and if this is the perfect time basically because you're limited as to who you can bring in um in terms of overseas acts especially with us you know being in brexit and whatnot um, or you know with Boris getting Brexit done as he likes to say so if that's the case why not use the opportunity to promote more people that are local and get them to basically go through the stages of being able to play you know for crowds that are very receptive to the kind of music because as great as it was for me the approach that I did where I purposely decided to kind of pull back from going to like sceny trendy places and to go and play and I then decided to go and play in bars and pubs around London basically taking my MIDI controller and plugging it into a PA system or something bringing my own PA system to go and um, use in there <laughs> unfortunately in order to get better at playing the music that I want to play I have to play in crowds I want to hear it <clears throat> much like you know being a stand-up comedian there is no way to learn that stuff at home you can't learn it on a computer you have to do it in real time and even even though i wasn't playing the stuff that i would have liked to have played at these bars and pubs i can still see i could still you know there, it was clear to see that there was a improvement in my ability to put together a set that was cohesive and that had a sort of you know groove to it that had a sort of theme to it that made sense that was a little bit of my personality with a little bit of what i thought the crowd would like you could see it in the set that i was playing but again i only got better because i was in front of people so it's a weird one it's a weird one's a hard one i think we've done some good i would like to see more from clubs but i did um but it's nice to see kind of devious one sort of uh share that sentiment and say aloud maybe somebody of his stature saying something like that saying hey as great as it is to book me i still want to see local users play as a good thing i always use this example all the time of why i kind of it was a bit of a mind what you got a, a bit of a res realization for me of why resident djs were so important was when I went to Nicaragua in like 27 or 2007 or something like that, right? I forgot what it was, 2007? I don't know. Whatever year that was, went to Nicaragua to go visit my friend. And I remember going to Leon, the, one of the main cities there, and to go and party and hang out and whatnot. And it's got a really vibrant clubbing scene there, right? There's loads of clubs like along the beach front that you can go to. Obviously, it's a little bit full of an expat town and loads of backpackers and whatnot, but there's still a lot of you know native Nicaraguans that live there. And I was going out in the night and I was really looking forward to it because for whatever reason in my head, I really wanted to kind of hear what local Nicaraguan kids listen to. What do they get down to? What's the vibe here? And I go into the club and they were legitimately playing like a Billboard Top 100 list of tunes. And I thought it was just one place. I went to another place, same thing, another place, same thing, same thing. Until I went to like a kind of bar karaoke place. That's the only time I heard legitimately music with like Spanish lyrics. Everything was just hip hop and rap or trap music or whatever was trendy at that time. And it was really disheartening because it was like clearly the people that were playing there were playing to the foreigners or playing to the tourists that were coming there. Um, and then clearly the people that were also playing weren't actually regular, you know, locals. They were just people that were basically playing to the people that they think would want to hear that sort of stuff. So you didn't really get a, uh, any sense of what the local music scene was like at all. And that's a similar sort of thing that happens here in the UK. You don't really get a sense of regionally what people are actually listening to because everyone plays the same stuff. Or if you do go to some places, it's all the same big ticket DJs that you see playing all the other major markets. So 
you know crap bad example but i'm pretty sure if you saw an immediate lens set in flipping antwerp it's going to be exactly the same set if you saw her in flipping dublin do you know what i mean it's going to be not that different whereas what you'd actually want to do is go dublin and go to like a random club and actually hear what the kids in that scene there like to listen to whether it's flipping disco music sped up really fast or you know um, electronic body music whatever something you want to hear something different or something specific to the area where you're in but you know maybe i'm looking too deeply into it but yeah good little interview there courtesy of um warp magazine it's a csr presents uh an interview with devious one that's what it means in spanish isn't it entrevista right and entrevista con devious one el lado artístico del techno i think that's what it means anyway let's continue let's continue and then there was this interesting article courtesy of mix mag which i don't think is true but it's interesting to kind of look at it says cocaine and ecstasy use has declined during the pandemic as a headline i'm not sure if that's true maybe now it has but in the beginning of time or in the beginning of the pandemic it felt like every time the, a good indicator of how much people are getting fucked up during the pandemic was always when you went to go throw your bin out especially in the apartment block that i live in there's obviously a communal bin um uh, or like a what you call it, a bin room whatever you know what i'm talking about and whenever you'd go down there on the weekend whatnot to throw away your stuff or to put your recycling away you just see boxes and i mean you know crates full of flipping bottles and shit or tins and whatnot you're like rotted people are getting it in and then you see boxes of pizza or whatever other takeaway that's what you know we're peak pandemic times but nowadays i'm not really seeing much of it as much you know anymore if anything i've seen especially people in my little social group more people are willing to go out for dinners go out to bars instead of staying at home and having drinks because you know why not especially if you can go out but i think there was a period even when lockdown did ease people were still staying indoors and drinking but i feel like people now are taking advantage of the fact that you know most everything is back to normal um you don't need to be presenting vaccine passes in places unless they ask you to do so so maybe that's a bit different but this is obviously talking about drugs specifically but let's continue on it says a new eu-wide poll has found that cocaine ecstasy use has declined during the pandemic while cannabis use has increased makes sense um the survey covering the year 2020 to march 2021 found that the usage of mdma ecstasy and cocaine decreased um uh, most among respondents in the year owing to the effective closure of pubs clubs and parties across most of europe published by the european monitoring center for drug and for drugs and drug addiction the survey covers use of cannabis herb and resin cocaine and ecstasy amphetamines methamphetamines, heroin and new psychoactive substances f nfmps the survey collected data between march and april 2021 among persons who took part in large scale eui poll consumptions of cannabis climbed the greatest of all illegal drugs in the first year of covid in limitations it's interesting i haven't really smoked much weed at all i don't i'm not really the biggest smoker in the world i think it doesn't really vibe with me too tough which is annoying because you know i'm one of those kind of rare white no white it's fraudulent slip there i said white I'm, I'm one of those um rare black guys who doesn't eat rice and doesn't smoke weed do you know what i mean very very bizarre or not, you know i'm not really I, i'm never gonna buy it. don't get me wrong if he gave me a plate of you know chicken fried rice i'll definitely eat it but i'm not gonna make it myself i'm not gonna order it in a menu but I'll, you know i'll definitely whack it down if you give it to me and weed for whatever reason just doesn't vibe with me i don't know why it's just one of those things even though sometimes I, I will have it if I'm going out on a night out and I'm getting amped and I want to kind of calm myself down, it's nice to have a little pre-roll that you can just puff on before you go to sleep or whatnot. But that's not really for me. It continues. Survey included around 49,000 participants from 21 EU nations as well as nine non-EU countries. During the data collected period, home was regarded as the most popular location for drug use. 85 percent of respondents in EU Switzerland study and 70 percent of Western Balkans a tendency amplified by COVID-19 lockdowns had not left any closures. So I think, weirdly enough, it must have been a good and a bad thing, because on one side, the whole taking drugs at home could be seen as being a bit of a loser like it's a bit it's kind of leaning on like crackhead sort of tendencies before pandemic right but during the pandemic there was nowhere else to go you needed a little bit of a release from the drudgery of flipping hearing how many people were dying all around the world from this mysterious virus you had no idea what it was so maybe tapping out of regular life by taking drugs was cool or it made some sense at that time and it kind of took away the stigma of doing drugs at home and look and feeling like a crackhead but then when stuff opens up again, the experience that you've got from doing drugs at home 
has basically led you to the understanding of that maybe you don't need it as much as you did in the past and then that helps to decrease it because once you're now going out because again once i've gone the places i've gone out so far especially parties and stuff i can't think of many events where i've been around people who are clearly steaming if anything there are obviously groups of people that are really crazy on it i think the last time i went was like maybe when i went that short time to go see um vtss is it her no spf dj i think in um what's that place e1 and uh, there was a lot of young kids there because i guess she's got a lot of young fans and whatnot and clearly that crowd was really you know at, at, like on edge like you know high as hell you know skanking off a skate on skank skanking off a cat or whatnot on the dance floor but i didn't feel like it was everybody it was just small pockets of people and it leads me to believe a lot of people are definitely going out drinking having a bit of a buzz or just hanging out for the sake of it it's not as kind of like project xc last party in the world sort of vibe anymore people are a lot more cut like if anything i feel like people have a far better relationships with drug and alcohol now in the uk than they did pre-pandemic yeah definitely 100 percent. because that was the one thing that was always horrible about nights out in the uk especially in london i think outside of london is far better nights outside in london are super 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 enjoyable but the the kind of flip of a coin here in the uk was that or in london sorry the problem was that for the most part a lot of your night's success was based on other people like would you cross paths with a prick yes or no is somebody going to step on your foot is a guy going to just be handsy like it's a it, it's a lot of things outside of your control that will dictate whether or not you have a good night or not and a lot of it involved people just getting too you know getting too fucked up too early um which will obviously affect especially if you're somebody in your own group but i feel like people have definitely now become a lot more sensible than growing up with how they go out and how they consume alcohol how they consume drugs i'd think so i'd think so but yeah interesting study here i won't read the whole thing um you know you can check out yourself if you're interested it's titled cocaine and ecstasy use has declined during the pandemic it's courtesy of mix mag if you're that way inclined check it out if you're that way inclined mm -hmm. what else we got here oh we have this feature courtesy of mix mag so I mentioned before the need of resident DJs and how it's super important nowadays concerning, especially when you consider the pandemic and the fact that many of the bigger DJs who are mostly based in parts of Europe are unable to come freely into the UK because of their own um, restrictions they have in their kind of home country or whatever reasons, visas, who knows. But it has kind of created a little opportunity for people like myself coming up. They just want to kind of establish themselves to get in and kind of slip through the cracks. But it's still not enough because, you know, at the time of speaking, there's a couple of big nights happening on the weekend on the 12th. And there's a few more happening the following weekend on the 19th with stacked DJs from all over Europe, like, you know, Freddie K, Sam, um, Dr. Rubenstein, Ricardo Villalobos, Gerd Jensen, Jennifer Capradini. There's loads of these really big DJs who are coming and all playing within the next kind of following weeks. So clearly there's an appetite to just keep doing what we were doing beforehand without really giving the local artists a chance. And I was thinking also, who was the last person that I remember from the scene who really kind of went from being a resident DJ to suddenly then being able to headline club nights? Now, you don't need to be headlining massive European ones, but going from being somebody that was DJing in one place, being a resident, which means in one club you get to play there, like, you know, let's say every weekend you maybe get to play the opening set between seven to 12 anytime between then and then the main person comes on sometimes you also end the night but usually that's who you are and you usually personally kind of need to have on retainer so they can just you know last minute they'll come if flipping um seth trucks that gets too fucked up and can't come you can get you can basically play and i can't think and i couldn't think and i remembered oh yeah the last person i remember who went from resident to professional was dj high who I remember from being a resident at Ridley Road Market Bar, a bar that I played at a few times, maybe a couple of times, I think specifically, tried to play it there again to no avail, which makes sense because I think at the time DJ High made it was a time that I was starting to play there and people started to hear that story that she was a resident DJ there and somebody noticed her and then she went from being playing in a small kind of um, cocktail bar. You know, I don't know, whatever you'd call it, whatever you call Radio Road Market Bar, like a local hangout bar that people you'd like to go to and have a good dance to then suddenly going to headline all the biggest clubs in the UK and then touring parts of Europe and releasing the tunes and shit. That was kind of an inspiring story so clearly people wanted to repeat the dude that's kind of following the footsteps and that happened to be the same time that i started playing there so of course when 
the booking started to fill up i went down in the kind of pecking order maybe it's because they didn't like my set i doubt it but it could be a reason but you know they stopped replying to my emails and whatnot which is always a bit embarrassing when it happens but again you, you don't know until you ask and yeah i can't think of anyone else since then who's kind of been able to go from resident to big headlining person i really can't make it think of it but this is, this is a cover story courtesy of mixed mag that features her which i think is really cool um more so just for the styling because it's cool to see a dj who doesn't wear all black that's always a nice kind of uh, refreshing thing to see in a dance floor especially when you're looking up at a booth you're not seeing the same person just wearing the same black top that you have on so that's nice um let's quickly read a bit of the article here it says after cutting her teeth playing video on market by Dawson every week before impressing the bookers at phonics in brixton she when she supported jack screen which is sick to know that little bit of detail so it wasn't actually at really road market bar but obviously that really road market bar might have led her to get the supporting role to support jack screen who knows but anyway Hyder sense the DJ has been a whirlwind. She began weekly finance residency, which she held for two years as a relative newcomer in October 2016. And by 2019, she was being booked for peak time sets in iconic just on the stage at Block 9 in Glastonbury. From plumbing, from plume, pummeling techno to breaks and heady 90s rave, high sets are fast and furious, weird and wonderful in her home world. Her style DJ is chaotic. In 2020, after self-releasing her EP, I joined the ranks of the muted uh, at Mute Records, the legendary London independent label. Since 1978, has released music by Depeche Mode, Fever Rain, Plastic Man, two Mute released EP Systems Up and Systems with Systems Up, Windows Down, and Put Your Head Above Your Parakeets, um, largely reflected on her dj's fierce mechanical techno um tenil was that is that her name tenil tenil trussel tenil frussel trussel frussel has a smile that lights up her whole face she talks openly excitedly about anything and everything da, da, da. what else continue on what's to say about that residency dj being uh having made her record have a record of lockdown the vote conference from legion underground was exactly what she needed it was such a leap from what i've been done before she says been able to write music on album but then of course COVID 19 happened and uh, for also spent lockdown in london with alice their home is a colorful warehouse conversion that's flooded with light of course she lives in a warehouse conversion look at her she's too cool she couldn't live in a regular new build flat like i do <laughs> um their home is a colorful warehouse conversion that floods with light filled with plants records and until recently a table tennis table i looked than purchase that provided hours of entertainment the plants have been suffering recently she confides the giant eight-year-old monster that continues here 220 was has been for us this year the day she was excited and uh, people were starting to take more notice of what i was doing she says but being forced to slow down had its benefits namely allowed her to have what it calls a renaissance with the music making side of her brain there's no doubt that djing is something that i love so fucking much but it was nice to have a space to remember that i'm a musician first and to really dive back into it that usually is kind of the unfair lucky no no that's usually the unfair advantage people have when they come into djing like if you're actually musically inclined and you can actually make music you actually played an instrument um you were in a band beforehand you dabbled in production and you've got good taste you can be a pretty sick dj but when you just come from it from like i did like from just a purely fan's point of view i won't say there's a ceiling but you have to work a lot more harder to get to that kind of level because you don't maybe have the not say the instincts but what it got regards i don't know what the thing is but you definitely see a difference from people that clearly have played in bands or had you know or maybe are classically trained when they go into djing they you know they you know, it's, it's like a fish to water it's flipping easy as hell um besides table tennis to make music for us or road the waves of the pandemic by trying to stay positive as she could some days she felt excited about producing and other days she felt hopeless i think it's an important thing to do especially for people who do a job like we do she says referring to herself and friend daniel avery we have such a privilege so it's important to really be part of the community and give back as much as you can which is nice you volunteer at a local food bank when clubs and dancers began to reopen the highest first show was back at a nation of god god one in germany she was booked to play one of the festival's most coveted sets and some rides russell played for three hours and felt wrecked with nerves throughout i felt so out of practice i'd always felt so in tune with reading the crowd until then i got myself into a bit of a funk the experience uh, sparked an existential trail of thought where she found herself thinking in a world where people are dying uh, and people are uh, and people are doctors and nurses what the fuck is djing true i think a lot of people had the existential crisis i think i had that with nice out especially the first especially when lockdown ease and people were going out i remember having a lot of those kind of outer body experiences on the dance floor thinking to yourself what am i doing here there's people dying around the world and here i am the first thought that i want to do is kind of run to a party but i think it's somehow um 
it is kind of like hardwired in us in times of real struggle and of real desperation to kind of just seek things that are going to distract us from the daily you know drudgery that we're kind of going through i think because there there's no other way to explain why those playgrounds are so popular do you remember when at the beginning of the pandemic people were legitimately running as cl as fast as they could to like random places all over the country to go and rave with strangers in the height of the pandemic when people didn't really know what was going on um so it's definitely i think something hardwired in us in terms of how we kind of deal with stress and whatnot um she says here yeah, the following weekend trust was back in the uk she played the study and calling fabrics opening weekend she says it was, to, it was reaffirming i was so happy that everyone, that I, was, I was happy i saw how happy it makes people feel i cut myself a bit of slack after that as she should it's a good little pose there great little outfit as well but yeah um pretty decent um interview recommend you check the whole thing i'm not going to read the entire thing but i thought those sections were quite interesting pretty illuminating and again um dj high might be the only person i can remember from going from residency to going to the big big slots in a while so hopefully that can get repeated for people like myself hopefully that can be repeated for people like myself and others next on the list what would you have to talk about here what do you think is interesting oh yeah, this is pretty cool isn't it or oh, not cool but this is pretty wild so most of you i think are aware of what's happening in canada with the canadian truckers who are basically blocking the border crossing in protest to the vaccine mandates that have been put in place i think for truckers for the most part it's a pretty wild thing to see from afar because it feels like a lot of working class people have had enough of these mandates and are trying to get back to some semblance of normality without any restrictions or you know being given the opportunity to basically exercise their freedom or whatever it may be and for whatever reason it doesn't seem to resonate very well with people who kind of would call themselves liberals people that would call themselves yeah people that call themselves liberals people that you think would be fighting for the rights of the working class are clearly being annoyed by it and there's a weird friction going on at the moment now in canada about what is right what's wrong um there's a whole controversy with gofundme as well with that it's absolutely wild but i'm going to quickly play this clip for you courtesy of npr that kind of gives an overview of the entire situation and i'm going to continue with the other bits of pieces i've got on it Canadian truck drivers have been blocking a border crossing with Montana and shutting down traffic in the capital, Ottawa. The so-called Freedom Convoy began almost a week ago as a protest over truckers losing their right to cross the U.S.-Canada border unvaccinated. The protesters include members of Canada's far right, as Emma Jacobs reports from Ottawa. In front of Parliament, the air smells of diesel exhaust. They love that shit, innit? As soon as they mention somebody's far right, it definitely it kind of removes any ability that you have to debate in good faith. It kind of removes it straight away. You're kind of banished into the shadow realms. You are marked as a bad person, evil Nazi. Nigger. Is Nazi what, what's worse? Being called a Nazi or a nigger? I don't know. Regardless, you know, it's just bizarre. Really, really bizarre. This world we live in. Um, there were right wingers there. Oh, dangerous. It's like. There's probably, yeah, there probably were some crazy far right ones because I know it kind of winds you up. They know it. That's why they do it. They just try and poke the bears. Just, just ignore them. Ignore them and they probably go away. And it also is a small minority. I think the most, I think, I guess the, I would imagine. I'm not there. I would imagine the majority of people there are, you know, protesting against the mask mandates or the vaccine mandates. That's basically it exhaust from idling engines truck horns blare constantly as they have for days don't tell me i need to be vaccinated don't you dare tell my kids that they need to be vaccinated dan brubaker who drove five hours to arrive here last friday mans a table piled with donated food underneath is a cardboard box baby wipes so if you can't have a shower there's other options <laughs> The convoy is having an impact well beyond Parliament Hill. For blocks, many businesses are closed. Jared Schechter, who works at a coffee shop that has stayed open for takeout, says protesters coming in argue about being asked to wear masks. Yeah, it's been very tough, unlike all of us, all the staff here. There have been... <laughs> it's been amazing. Like, somebody speaking with a mask on, it's just automatically, you just feel like, ugh, come on, brother, just take it off and speak and then put it back on again. But yeah, the... The, the resistance against masks and vaccines in parts of North America, and it's just weird, isn't it? It feels like the way that they kind of, the, the way that they're against it, it kind of feels like it's an affront. 
like somebody kicked their door down and wants to have you know you know um sexual relations with their wife or something it's like that's not not that deep it really isn't but i don't know man they just seem to have a very different reaction to it especially than what we are in europe because again for me regardless of what my reservations are about the entire thing i just got double jobs so i can live my life so i can do the things i enjoy to do like travel go to festivals go to parties um djing places like that's basically why i get it I, I just did it for my own kind of personal benefit i think a lot of people in europe did the same thing they just weighed up you know they kind of especially it's like what happened in france like the whole thing what um, macron was doing where he was basically saying he was trying to annoy people by basically saying that how the only way you could enjoy hospitality and go to bars and cafes and whatnot is by getting double vets because without a vaccine passport you can't get in and i think most people even without that sort of like nonsense um prompt were doing that i know i did i just kind of weighed up the pros hey what 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 would this pass allow me to do why did the negatives and just say you know what the pros outweigh the negatives fuck it let's just get it but of course i drew the line at that no more boosters but it's just weird how kind of viscerally angry they sound when they're talking about vaccines and mask mandates. It's very, very interesting. And then we continue here. This article occurs your Daily Mail with um, focus on the work, works on the truckers talking about how they don't think Justin Trudeau, the prime minister there, doesn't think that they don't think he basically has any idea what the regular person goes through, which I definitely agree. It says here exclusive. It says you don't know what it's like to have working hands. Canadian Freedom Convoy truckers plus Justin Trudeau saying his vaccine mandates would keep them out of their rigs of weeks um, at a time and threaten their livelihoods. It's interesting how Daily Mail have kind of normalized having full sentences or paragraphs in their titles, isn't it? Back in the day, your titles would be just a snappy seven or ten words that you'd say to kind of get people locked into your article to read the entire thing. But they give you the entire synopsis in this kind of big chunk at the top. It's really weird, isn't it? It's a way to kind of put together an article. But anyway, it continues. It says, the Freedom Convoy of Truckers that has descended on the Canadian capital has slammed the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau over the government's vaccine mandate. The massive uh, cavalcade of trucks, pickups and other vehicles have been wrecking havoc on the downtown tour scene um, since last weekend, sorry, deliberately blocking traffic and honking their horns almost non-stop around Parliament Hill. Don't get me wrong, if you lived around there, you'd probably be annoyed. Regardless of what you think, regardless of how much you agree with them, um, you would definitely be pissed off after, especially after the first week. It's like all the pots and pans. Remember that thing? How flipping R worded was that? We would stand outside of our windows, or I, I wouldn't. I didn't clap once. Like you know, get me to do that lame shit. But remember, people slapping their pots and pans, helping the NHS. I was like, what? You're clapping and patting things for people doing their jobs. What next? Are we gonna start having flipping open bus parades for women that get pregnant? Like, is that what we're gonna do? People, women, we don't know like let's relax they're doing their job it's standard and most of them weren't you just look on tiktok they were flipping dancing and shucking and jiving all over the place and doing challenges like nonsense massive cavalcade there um but truckers have remained defined even as as the protests entered their sixth day thursday vowing to stay put until trudeau's government flips and withdraws his policy on vaccine mandates which is whew, it's, this is a, but that's the whole point of protesting you're meant to make people feel uncomfortable you're meant to kind of upset people you're meant to make them question things push their buttons that's how change comes about you don't get change by putting on a funky hat you know i mean and and making up you know lyrical chants and then going on your merry way no you make you make change by kicking up a fuss you know making sure people don't sleep for a couple of weeks that's how you actually change things Logo trucker Guy Meister is among those who joined the convoy last week after making a 20-hour journey in his big rig from Nova Scotia. The 56-year-old who has been on protest since its inception revealed he is committed to sticking it out. Um, I guess that's him, right? Yeah, that's him. Guy Mister, looking absolutely superb in his truck. I love these trucks, especially with all the many different gear, gear knobs and whatnot. Like, that is, that, that truck has seen some dangs mandate freedom loads of people there freedom what's that fuck trudeau that's a pretty good sign i'm not going to lie uh yeah living the living the dream um says here i'm in it for the long haul mr said trudeau has to go mr who has been driving a truck since he was 19 said he believes the government mandate is ineffective and that the policy will only hurt him in the fellow truckers i wonder if that's a thing that gets passed down to generation to generation that probably is a thing right i'd imagine certain routes certain companies that you work for it's probably all kind of very family oriented or friends of friends if, you know to make sure everyone that's doing it is legit and isn't going to fuck around because as much as 
yeah, because it's a very important job. You know what I mean? You can't have people just taking the piss or not doing a job properly. So I wonder if he gets passed down to you. Like you have your dad has the role and he basically teaches you how to drive. He teaches you how to pick up things, how to do all the necessary stuff. You get introduced, you get vetted. Remember, I, I wonder if that's the thing. That's pretty cool that it kind of stays in the family like that. And it's clearly a pretty decent career. Obviously, you know, the I guess the negatives are that you're always on the road and away from your family a lot, but they probably get to see all parts of the country. They get to see the, the highs and the lows, basically, in it. Um, he explained that if he were to bring in a truckload to the United States and return to Canada under the current mandate, he would have to quarantine and be unable to work for 14 days. Okay, that's the main sticking point, it seems like, because obviously these people, these truckers, you know, you only earn when you're basically driving. So if you're not driving, you're not earning. And if you're not earning, you can't support your family, especially in these treacherous times. So being 14 days out of work, every time you go in and out, it's just crazy amounts of days you're working you're losing said as well which would bankrupt him and others when i when i take a load into us come in direct contact with very few people he says if anyone i'm back i back my load into a dock they unload it and the person puts the paperwork into the cab all without any direct contact it doesn't make any sense that's a very good point very very good point they, exactly they don't talk to anybody they're, they're basically self-isolating from the moment they start driving and, unless they pick up a little lot lizard in it Maester said that he has no plans to get vaccinated, at least now, and would rather wait until more is known about the vaccine's long-term effects, which, why is that controversial? Legitimately, why is that, like, why is, I, I know, don't get me wrong, the other snippet I played of people going, I'm not getting it under any circumstances, uh, it's going to turn you into a snake. <clears throat> that is crazy. But someone clearly saying, I'm just not comfortable putting something in my body that I feel like has been rushed. Is that okay to not to say, is that not okay to say? Even though, you know, the evidence probably points to it being more safe than it is bad for you, still. I don't think that's a, such an extreme thing to say, but for some reason that's like conspiracy theory stuff to say. It's like, you know, God almighty. When they change the model um, year of a, of a vehicle, it takes two or three years to get it right. So why would you do, why, why do you get vaccinated right off the bat when you don't know all the bad and good of it? Huh? You comparing yourself to a car, bruv? All right. Anyway, raising both his hands, he also issued a message to the Prime Minister to Trudeau. These are working hands. You don't know what it's like to have working hands. I work for all the people in our country. You don't. You have to go. So, yeah, Trudeau's privilege is coming in and biting him in the buck, isn't it? But, yeah, anyway, Tara Lynch, uh, da, da, let's continue about this. And then, of course, GoFundMe announced that they were going to, you know, not give the truckers the funds that they were raised. I think it was like $8 million which is absolutely crazy and insane. And then for whatever reason, the Ottawa Police Department thanked GoFundMe on their official Twitter profile, saying we want to thank GoFundMe for listening to our concerns as the city and the police services and the decision to withhold the funding for these unlawful demonstrations is an important step and we'll call on crowd sites to follow. So essentially, the Ottawa Police Department are working lock and step with a startup with a company that's meant to be providing people with the means to raise money for whatever cause that they want, especially if it kind of abides by the, you know, GoFundMe terms of services. And they got to shut it down. Police intervention shut it down. Like, this is some scary shit, man. This is a real, real, real scary shit. And then, of course, they then decided to, I think, off the back of this, I think what happened originally I don't, again i don't know why this is the case i was assumed whenever someone raises money from gofundme and imagine if it's like a, a, a serial killer there's some someone ends up setting up a gofundme for them it raises loads of money and obviously gofundme then steps in and says hey this can't run on our site usually i would have assumed when they cancel the the funding page or they basically end it even if it's passed even if it's achieved its goal i just assumed they automatically refund the money i didn't i didn't even think it was a thing where they take the money and redistribute it to random charities no i just assumed if you raise money for a cause that they don't feel like aligns with their policies or their tos they just end it and they refund everybody that pledged not the case sometimes they'll take it sometimes they won't depends case to case because i guess in this one they are basically saying they were going to send it to random charities then they said they weren't then they say people could um, get a refund if they ask for it like crazy shit like what do you mean ask for it if, if we're not if the money i sent isn't going to the people that i wanted to go to give back my money that's how it should be why were you going to redistribute my money that's not where it's going to go and then of course they clarified it because now i think is for out of nowhere it doesn't make any sense really i don't know why this is the case but ron DeSantis right decided to kind of stick his nose in and get involved 
Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida and basically said he's going to investigate um, GoFundMe and prosecute them for the kind of shady stuff they were doing in terms of withholding the funds, which is absolutely nuts, isn't it? Like, who would have thought that? Um, oh, no, sorry. Um, let's clarify this. So GoFundMe did, did say then to simplify the process. So after all the backlash, they then came out and basically said, well, now we're doing the right thing. So they had to be pushed into being the right thing. To simplify the process of our users, we'll be refunding all donations to the Freedom Convoy 2022 fundraiser. This refund will happen automatically. You don't need to submit a request. Donors can request. So donors can expect to see refunds within seven to ten business days. The update we issued earlier enabled all donors to get refunded and outlined a plan to redistribute remaining funds. However, due to donor feedback, we are simplifying the process. Donor feedback. That isn't something you should get feedback from. You should just send it. You should just send it back to people when they want, if they don't want to, if the money isn't going to the people that they want it to go to. Donor feedback, you know. Anyway, Rodan DeSantis is on there next. He said, Go for me reverse his plans on freedom, on freedom convoy donations. Sorry, Florida Governor Don Ron DeSantis promises investigation. So, off the back of this, some interesting things are going to end up happening. They're going to end up shaking some things up and maybe some truths that we all don't want to hear about. Um, <laughs> um, Go for me, might get raised, is there? GoFundMe website has reversed um, course and decided to automatically refund donations. Um, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said Saturday morning that he and his state's attorney general will investigate GoFundMe after it shut down the fundraiser. Um, West Virginia Attorney General also joined in asking its residents to contact his office and let him know if they had been victimized by a deceptive act or practice by GoFundMe. Oh my God. GoFundMe originally shut down donations because of what it called law enforcement reports of violence and other unlawful activity. At first, GoFundMe said that they would um, refund anyone who asked and donate the remainder of the charities chosen by the Freedom Convoy. I'm not even sure if this is legit. This must have been some new terms that they've kind of injected into it because if this is the case it means anybody that raises money for a good cause if somebody decides to swat them or if somebody decides to kind of stand there and be a babe bad faith actor and just start causing fights and shit or just start doing unruly things does that mean your entire donation page gets taken down you don't get the funds that you kind of raised fairly and squarely is that what happens i don't think so i think they just made up something to just obviously take um because again these platforms are not platforms unfortunately they're just mostly publishers aren't they um unless what you're doing aligns with their political ideologies they can't allow you to and again i don't know why we want this why do we want a internet that's divided by your political leanings we should be able to share the same internet the same social media space the same way we share the same flipping world and wherever else we go and hang around it's not as if we have different you know shops and bars and beaches and you know restaurants and stuff that we go into that are mostly catered towards people that vote the same way as us who cares what you vote for especially when you're trying to raise money for charity like who gives a fuck really especially if it's going to so that what this means if it's going to a good cause and the person happens to be an ardent right winger does that mean they'll take him off the platform huh like ugh. Anyway, however, the website led to scrap the plan saying the donor feedback and led to simplify things. The fundraiser had hit 10 million Canadian dollars, around 7.9 US dollars, with $1 million already distributed before the fundraiser was halted. So they sent out 1 million, which is kind of less than what? That's probably like 700,000, I guess, thousand dollars, but the rest of it they kept, it looks like. GoFundMe's original plan didn't sit well with DeSantis. He tweeted, it's fraud for GoFundMe to come to commandeer 9 million in donations and send to support truckers and give it to causes of their own choosing. Of course it is. Like, straight up, like, such a weird thing. I, I wonder if that's always been a situation. From what I know, I don't think it has. You just get, if you do something that they don't like or there's too much, you know, bad press around it they'll just cancel it and refund everybody but for whatever reason they were gonna send it to charities that you know random charities my ass that was going into the flipping people that work there's pockets probably i'd imagine allegedly i don't know i'm just talking about my ass don't sue me <clears throat> anyway continuing on for that one oh yeah and then to end it actually this is a quite a funny video run the sorry um justin trudeau basically saying he's not intimidated whilst he stands and gives a press conference in an un um what you call it in a secret location somewhere because he was afraid for his life because all the truckers were you know going outside of what is his house house of residence whatever it is so this is justin trudeau talking i want to be very clear we are not intimidated by those who hurl insults and abuse at small business workers and steal food from the homeless we won't give in to those who fly racist flags. We won't cave 
to those who engage in vandalism or dishonor the memory of our veterans. There is no place in ah, our... I knew it was now. He's asked dishonor the memory of our veterans. What are you talking about, brother? What are you talking about? Then next on the list here, I wanted to quickly mention this. This is a weird one to mention because I don't think it really matters, right? But do you remember when the whole Daniel Lee stuff was going down? When, you know, the former creative director or fashion director for Bottega Veneta who went through a very um interesting incident where where it was alleged that he might have used some inflammatory language similar to what joe rogan's being accused of using right calling somebody in his office meeting an an n-bomb or something along those kind of lines which is interesting too because it feels like because Bottega Veneta was so loved by certain people within fashion especially black people they specifically turned a blind eye to it because they just loved the brand too much it felt like no one went to investigate it deeper no one or maybe because of the person who said it maybe because people some people don't like that louise louisano is it Luis? whatever his name is on instagram and twitter maybe because people don't like him they didn't take the allegation that he said or the allegation that he put out there seriously and they kind of just because they didn't feel like people followed up on it they just kind of you know oh he might have said it, he might have not and it wasn't as much backlash against what he said about Bottega Veneta vis-a-vis -vis what Dos what happened to Dosio Gabbana, right? In terms of people cancelling them and saying, you know, nowadays if you see a prominent celebrity being dressed in Dosio Gabbana, especially from people on fashion Twitter, they always have a lot of things to say about it, and especially people like Alexander Wang. But for every reason, Bottega Veneta, people are, you know, those guys and girls I see, especially some of the um, the black fashion crew people, are still wearing the puddle boots, which I call the nigger boots, right? They're still wearing those. they still got the bags and the bomber jackets and the pants and stuff. It's interesting. They just kind of turn the blind eye anyway it doesn't matter one of the things that people like myself were accusing particular for, for, for doing at the time i thought which kind of kind of was to their favor especially daniel lee because it carried him a lot of favor right with the black community i feel like there was a lot of pandering when it came to particular Veneta. like clearly a lot of pandering especially when you see the guy himself do you know what i mean he doesn't necessarily ooze any kind of core he's not really about the culture really you know what i mean he just looks like a dork in this little ginger speckled dork right with a bird chest and this guy was now you know featuring all these prominent um you would call them say non-white creatives that happen to you know they happen to cross paths with and kind of putting them front and center of his shows campaigns blah 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 blah, blah. And obviously it worked because when he then got accused of calling somebody the end bomb in the office, people kind of just assumed it wasn't true because he puts people like us in flipping adverts. And now we're seeing this interesting thing I saw courtesy someone brought it to my attention on social media, the, on Twitter specifically, regarding Sawarski. For whatever reason, Sawarski have kind of pivoted and changed how they are um, presenting their jewellery by having a lot of people who look like myself uh, modeling the stuff as you can see on one of these pictures and i wonder is it pandering to have people like this in these sort of product shots you know if you're not watching this um it's basically a really cool looking black kid um who's kind of making this lucent Sawarski ring that's 280 euros only look incredible with what he's wearing especially against his skin tone and what it looks flipping beautiful the pictures are fantastic right the kids well manicured he's got a grill on him he just looks great but I wonder is it pandering and if it is pandering does it matter like is this a is this a um, is this like a necessary journey in order for people that look like myself black people to basically have some semblance of um influence within the fashion industry this is how you get in when they normalize stuff like this like in terms of using black models in these sort of press shots and these sort of campaigns it actually serves as a net positive because what it means is that now this becomes a norm people then don't start to have quotas when it comes to runways or start saying crazy shit like oh we already have a black model on our books you know what i mean because they just treat it like hey can you present the clothes in a um in a somewhat authentic way can you bring it to life somewhere on the runway and that's about it and just continue from there maybe that's the thing i don't really too sure but i saw these pictures especially concerning sports girls like hmm i've not really seen much of this and it got me thinking about the stuff that i didn't like to see when i saw um elton doing the campaign for tiffany and co and i thought that was pandering right they got him to dress up in a tux and start breakdancing in the middle of a flipping basketball court with some kids 
pop shoving and kick flipping around him just didn't make any sense it basically felt like they got the coolest black kid they could find online especially and basically got him to dance you know for what his supper i don't really know specifically don't ask me what because i don't want to say what i really think and get kicked off of youtube but yeah man it's an interesting approach i feel like um some cool stuff obviously here yeah, i'd love these ear cuffs i've seen rick owens wear a few of these i didn't actually know what they were I, at first i thought they were piercings because rick owens wore a few of these um during the pandemic it felt like i always saw him kind of rocking these sort of things um is it an ear cuff no, that, yeah that is an ear cuff so basically there are ear cuffs so i don't know if you guys know they exist but some of them are just things that you basically put inside your earlobe this actually looks like it might be an actual earring oh no it's an ear cuff actually so why is it on his earlobe and not in the ear itself but usually people wear it on the inside so i've seen him do that but i don't know yeah maybe it's pandering maybe it doesn't really matter and i'm just kind of making a, a nothing out of something which is basically um making something out of nothing which is basically the key of a great podcaster right is to take a very mundane topic that no one really cares about and try and stretch it as much as you can and fill in the gaps as i'm doing right now by filling in gaps but i don't know i saw it and i was a little bit i wonder why they're doing this is this clearly a way to kind of market to young a younger demographic to get people that look like myself to wear this sort of stuff because they know we are the trendsetters even though we don't make up a big chunk of the customers that buy any bits of fashion because there's not many of us especially in the western world um it's still no denying that our influence is outsized if someone like myself who i kind of count myself to be quite forward thinking and a bit of a trendsetter and making the move the needle move decide to put um some needle move i can't even say it properly that's why i you know i'm not a needle mover but if there are people that exist out there who are real needle movers you know when they put this kind of stuff on it's immediately going to increase the core factor it's going to immediately increase the desirability and then suddenly people that would never think they would need some Swarovski's crystals in their collection are suddenly like you know what that Swarovski choker is not a bad idea you know for 400 euros maybe it's something I buy for myself for my flipping birthday or something I don't know maybe it's a thing but maybe it's actually like i said maybe it's a good thing it's a sign of real acceptance when they start to you know less of less of a tokenism and more so of like no you're actually the best person to actually make this thing bang you know what i mean for real um uh but yeah i don't know how to feel about it i'm not too sure it's like being um it's like being a race diversity hire right i remember seeing that happening a lot in fashion just during the kind of the post George Floyd thing there's a lot of kind of brands and uh magazine publishers and whatnot deciding to invent these bullshit roles like racial diversity officer shit I don't know what that means it's like what are you in charge of the fucking playlist do you put on the fucking money bag yo on the on the Friday nights on the Friday just before everyone goes for drinks I don't really know what it means but it always felt like a kind of tokenism it felt like a token gesture like oh you're the black one you're the one that wears a cork wacky prince here's a here's a job that only the blackies are going to take but maybe just getting your foot in the door is better than nothing because of how you know in demand those positions are in fashion right everyone wants to be um, that person everyone wants to have those roles so maybe just having any role regardless of how you got it if you got it because of the size of your boobies how tall you are how good looking you are it doesn't matter because you know so many people want that job that you just take it and you just take it as you take what you're given in that regard i don't know i don't know but anyway it looks cool regardless most of the stuff's on pre-order Swarovski crystals look pretty interesting loads of things i'd actually buy myself um especially when you see some of the colors and whatnot there was one specific one that i like this yeah this um kind of little ear cuff that makes you look like you got three massive flipping diamonds hanging off the top of your earlobe um also the top of your ear sorry is pretty pretty cool looking i'm not gonna lie it's pretty pretty cool and then of course on the model itself it looks fucking banging in it look at that look how good that looks and the braids too tight but yeah big up everybody involved in that one and i think if i'm not mistaken the actual person involved in this is actually one giovanna battaglia if you remember her now she goes by giovanna um engelbert which is i guess her um married name but she's now the creative director of swarovski so that might make a you know a point as to why they're kind of pivoting into pandering to black people which is not pandering maybe it's a cool thing i don't know what it is um obviously they've got the uh model adwa what's her name 
Adwa something. I forgot her surname. But yeah, she's obviously featured on one of the first campaigns of it. So maybe there was a concerted effort to basically make it a little bit more culturally relevant to some of the kids. Uh, what if relationship with Jurek? You don't care about that. Anyway, if you're a career stylist, how do you discover Swarovski? We don't care about that. What is your most interesting thing you learn about crystals? We don't care about that. For your first question, what's your number one? Yeah, cool. For your first question, what's your number one goal to achieve? Oh, she designed some of this stuff. No wonder they look so lavish and chic and rich. Because imagine, I'd imagine Giovanna hasn't had to eat a flipping ham and cheese toasty in her life, has she? Right? She always has the finer things in life, which again, no hate. Congratulations to her. But that's why the jewelry looks so um, opulent, let's say. Where is she? To give a crystal cooler. Where is it? Yeah, so on. Um, so yeah, for this first collection, what was your number one goal to achieve? Um, she says as follows: to give Crystal a cooler, smarter dimension. I wanted to, uh, I was going to, to explore the beauty of Crystal and how its magnificence um, roots in fundamental geometrical and logical structures. This jewelry is not on display of someone's wealth, but their ability to express themselves in cool and playful way. Jewelry does not have to be pretentious. I like that. It can be fun, playful, and dictate and express the mood we're in. My intention is to create collections, pieces that are bold, but can be worn in effortless way. Is jewelry for playful extravagance that doesn't feel forced or expensive so or expressive but it's expressive and original i agree with that i think a lot of the stuff that we saw here um just looks really nice and especially look this doesn't look too crazy it just looks a little bit expressive it looks like you're you know you might like a bit of fashion um it continues there let's continue there in terms of design process what did you enjoy most a famous jeweler once said between the idea of a piece of jewelry and the finished product there were like three liters of tears 400 hours of yelling on the phone and endless letterings etc and that's how i feel in every piece there were countless details to consider and the decisions to make innovation in mind the entire collection was an incredible challenge that swarovski managed to bring to life even in the time of covid which is not a small task so yeah big up um giovanna Big up this new uh, push with COVID. I mean, this new direction that Swarovski are going in. Um, it looks like it's going to work because someone like myself is talking about Swarovski and I would never care about them as a brand. I don't care if they're pandering to me, pander to me some more, pander to me some more. Give me all the diamonds. Give me all the jewels. <clears throat> Next on the list here. What do you want to talk about? Oh, yeah, let's just update on the Spotify thing. That might be a good one to go on. So this is courtesy of The Verge. It looks like the um, backlash and outrage about Joe Rogan's N-bomb tirade and, you know, Planet of the Apes um, movie joke thing that he thought, you know, was funny, which I think was funny, to be completely honest. But also, that was probably the most egregious part of the whole thing, right? The N-bomb thing was like, whatever. Um, I listened to enough Come Town to, you know, know these whiteies love to drop the old um, end bomb to be a little bit controversial and kind of like be like oh, i can't believe you said that i don't really take it too seriously but um that planet of the Apes story was fucked but anyway regardless um you know the backlash is relentless it looks like because this is probably one of the things that they it, this probably isn't the reason why they want him out they probably want him out more so because he seems to be the one person everyone seems to be listening to in the states it feels like it feels like a lot of people don't trust msnbc they don't trust cnn they don't trust fox they don't trust a lot of the things in there um but they all seem to agree that joe rogan does say some good and bad things they all can kind of agree on it which again goes to speak to his influence so maybe this is more so the mainstream media the msn as they like to call them over there in the states deciding enough is enough when you can't let this guy take away all the eyes and ears from our stations bleed us dry you know death by a thousand cut style why is he ranting into a microphone about you know ivermectin and all this sort of kind of and drinking donkey piss to cure stuff and doing kettlebell swings i don't know whatever this guy talks about um and i'm joking about it because i listen to it all the time but you know what i mean but anyway so it looks like spotify had another meeting another clarification as to what their stance is regarding joe rogan we all know what the stance is they signed him for 100 million dollars anyone thinking that they're gonna dump him is just dumb unless literally evidence comes out that he runs over kids outside of school or something like that or he had said something super egregious like what alex jones says about sandy hook that's not happening even if that didn't happen they would still have to pay him out right he's probably got decent lawyers on deck i'd, I'd imagine on retainer who would be able to kind of do that deal somebody as smart as him is probably going through those 
motions and dotting his eyes crossing his t's in case that does happen and there's probably clauses involved in the contract there's loads of things like just to, to think these people in social media clearly sitting there thinking that they're just going to drop him like they dropped louis ck and stuff it's just nonsense like you don't give someone a hundred million dollars if you don't you know do your due diligence and do background checks and have all these different contingencies in, in place or you know have these different scenarios that you play out i'm sure that they kind of did that in that respect the only thing that's been surprising has been how shook and panicked the comedians have been around him i feel like the way spotify has replied has been fairly you know made sense completely how they kind of done it i feel like they've kind of went through that process but the comedians panicking around joe has been a bit cringe but anyway um this is close to the verge so spotify is more concerned about joe rogan than ever supposedly um joe rogan's situation is spotify keeps getting more confused um as the situation has involved so has the company's treatment of the star podcaster one day it says it's hands-off platform that treats all creators the same the next it admits to having backdoor discussions with joe rogan and pulling episodes due to an outrage over the language the whiplash undermines spotify's narrative about how it interacts with rogan and other podcasters offers a window to the delicate relationship between rogan and the company that depends on him to stay different sorry to stay differentiated differentiated um let's dive into where these things are lining up um i would rather these places or spots or yeah i'd rather spotify just you know stay as a platform if you then become a publisher that means certain artists who are on that platform or on that um you know uh, what they call it um dsp um you then have to take them off because clearly some of the people's works or lyrics or whatnot won't kind of directly in line up with maybe the founders ideologies or political leanings and you don't want that you just want there to be a place where you can go and tune in and check out podcasts that are in your kind of interest field without having the threat of somebody taking it off because it doesn't line up with what the world thinks should be on these platforms just be a platform allow people to put stuff on there and let the flipping market decide if people like it they like it they don't they don't but this kind of regulating of who gets to speak and how they get to speak and who they speak about and what they speak you know on is just annoying it really is it's more annoying than what he said it really is this kind of ardent limiting of free speech is just flipping crazy spotify has reiterated multiple times now that it considers itself merely a platform of podcasts which i agree despite paying rogan a 400 million to distribute his show what does that mean what's this snarky comment from Verge mean so because you pay somebody 100 million to come on your platform because you want them to bring 100 million dollars worth of eyes and ears and attention that somehow means that you're not a platform what i guess because if technically if you give someone money you're basically kind of turning into a publisher because you're having to approve i guess that's maybe the i don't know just a weird thing to say that spotify wants to believe rogan is an audio creator um like any other which he is um been a constant refrain since new young and other musicians that play da, da, da. um spotify was paying 100 million to exclusively to exclusively distribute the rogan experience should not change anything according to ceo daniel Eck, who directly addressed the relationship he said even though jerry is an executive is an exclusive it is licensed content it's important to note that we do not have any creative control over joe rogan's content we don't approve his guests in advance and just like any other creator we get his content when he publishes it then we review it and if it violates our policies we take the appropriate enforcement actions but this is the problem that I had with Joe personally, myself as a longtime fan. When he originally signed to Spotify and all those episodes didn't pull over the 40 or so that they were, and the whole excuse or lie that he said was that, oh, there was still a lot of kind of getting ported over from his um, feed or his RSS or over to Spotify. So it takes some time to populate. And obviously that didn't make sense because a hundred million dollar deal, you're not going to just start populating podcasts over to spotify on the same day you're going to put concessions in place to maybe speed up the process or whatever it just didn't make any sense but then people let him get away with that lie because it was 100 million dollars but it's, if you think about it to be kind of again somewhat critical and think with some sort of a rational mind and you know and not be too wrapped up in the fact that i like the guy that was maybe the first sign of trouble the fact that he was ready and willing to acquiesce to Spotify's demands the, the, the moment he signed and dumped those 40 episodes, there's no surprise. It should be no surprise that he's now acquiescing to get rid of the 100 episodes or so or 70 that contain him saying the M-bomb. It's easy to do it once you do it once. But then he tried to make it seem like he didn't do it. And then once it finally got out that he did and he kind of admitted in a joking manner, he kind of tried to act like it was no big deal. But it was because you've always been mr censorship anti-censorship guy 
you've always been the guy that's been rallying against um you know corporate especially tech lord tech overlords and in some parts the whole reason why joe rogan went on spotify was because of how he felt like youtube were you know basically um limiting his ability to do his show correctly by you know maybe blocking his show in some places um demonetizing it in some places copyright striking here and there they're just putting up loads of roadblocks that wasn't allowing him to do his show without a peace of mind so that's why basically taking the guaranteed 100 million dollars from spotify sounded like a genius idea at the time but that initial giving up of like those episodes really kind of set the precedent that you know they're probably going to come from more down the line than they have it continues here it says echoes also clear that rogan was critical to the company's success telling employees that spotify's catalog wasn't dif uh, differentiated from rivals and that signing exclusive like rogan gave the company leverage to negotiations with amazon google and tesla signing rogan helped turn spotify into a number one podcast app in the us he noted signing one person that's why i think sometimes these cancellation people are weird do you see how much value he's bringing to this company? Because they know stocks and share prices go up and down. This shoe shall pass in a few weeks, right? Maybe, who knows? Because it looks like they're coming from super hard, but still, it will pass. He has made them the number one podcasting app in the US, despite Apple having a massive head start on Spotify. Basically, Apple basically created podcasts, right? In the kind of conventional sense like having it on your phone and stuff and syncing it download like they basically created it and somehow Spotify was able to jump over them right easy jumped over the, the fucking um jump man crazy so it makes sense why they would you know stand by him to that extent but it's also pretty indicative of startup culture right and i've been in places like that myself don't get me wrong we have flat hierarchies where the founder and ceo or whatnot is having to explain and justify his decisions at that level to regular staff it's mad isn't it and you're having to kind of literally say hey by the way the reason why we signed rogan is so we could like keep all of you guys some of you guys that like just retweet playlists or share stuff and whatnot you guys probably are stealing a living you're getting paid forty thousand dollars a year to send newsletter emails and whatnot the reason why we're able to keep you even though business isn't booming is because joe rogan's come in and brought all these listeners who are now signing up to premium who are playing his you know his flipping podcast on loop and whatnot who are maybe then deciding to listen to other bits of content that are on spotify like <laughs> like shut the hell up isn't it like this guy's literally paying your wages in a weird way which again is another example of people not basically you know following through on their or not having a real moral backbone because if you really didn't agree with what joe rogan said and you really do disagree with his political leanings or how he maybe expresses himself you would also quit your job if that if joe rogan's on your platform as a defy as a mark of defiance or right, you would do that but people don't because they're full of shit um it continues at this point spotify's position seemed to be clear rogan was, crit was critically important to spotify's success and he would be allowed to say whatever he wanted as long as it was in the bounds dustin jenkins spotify's head of global communications and public relations affirmed to spotify's employees that rogan would be treated like any other creator under those rules we applied those policies consistently and objectively he she wrote to note to staff thank god leave it alone um one of the interesting parts about it i thought uh was this bit about a hundred dollars or something what is it ba, ba, ba. where was it there it goes yeah this i thought was funny right um so after the pr crisis spotify reached out to rogan and got him to agree to remove episodes of his show from his platform x memo also says the company will now dig dictate uh, dedicate sorry 100 million dollars to licensing and marketing content made by creators from historically marginalized communities and move the company has not actually announced officially but clearly wants credit for so they're committed to dropping 100 million m's on people like me right little old neg nogs like me right because they feel like you know he dropped too many m bombs on his show i for one will gladly take them up on that offer if they want to send me a spare one hundred thousand grand so i can upgrade my setup and get a studio and whatnot i will be happy to take that gladly if that means you know i have to sit in a room and have joe rogan's end bomb compilation play on loop you know without headphones i'll do it Rago. <laughs> rags is like i'll do it <laughs> that might be one of the best things to come out of this nonsense but yeah what an absolute shit show of a situation in it what an absolute shit show um next on the list we have dears courtesy of tmz 
um, Louis Vuitt cops plea deal in assault case to get three years probation. Did you have any idea this happened? I remember this happened, but for whatever reason, I forgot about it, which is basically evidence of a very um, well-run PR company, machine, agency, record label, whatever Rock Nation are. They run a tight ship because somehow they were able to bury and sweep the story under the rug for the entire time that it was being investigated. And now that he's been given three years probation, essentially a slap on the wrist and some, you know, what was it called? Um, he has to go and do like anger management, all those sort of things. It's basically the case is done. He can basically continue his career without any real backlash. And also part of the reason why I think, again, oh, just to highlight the story. So, to, for 2020, 2021, I think, beginning or something along those kind of lines, a story went vi viral that supposedly says Louis Vert was, um, happened to be in the area where his ex, Brittany, was in the area too, where she was having a meeting with another artist called St. John. Louis Vert sees them, gets angry, agitated by it, confronts her, confronts St. John, swings at St. John, misses the gun that he has in his, hole, in his pants, drops on the floor, there's a scuffle. He gets the gun, he picks it up, he points it at Brittany um, Belly, who happens to be his ex-girlfriend, and some commotion happens or whatnot, and then he leaves. So, you know, clearly some mad situation. And this seemed to happen at the same time or just after the whole Tory Lane situation happened with him allegedly shooting Megan Thee Stallion in the feet. And for whatever reason, the Tory Lane situation seemed to get a lot more, Tory seemed to get more vitriol against him than Lil Zivert did even though the Torres Lane situation, there wasn't really any evidence or proof that he did do what he was alleged to have done. Whereas the Louis Vert thing seems like it was a bit more cut, clear cut because there was witnesses there. It was outside of a busy cafe. There's probably cameras. It just seemed a bit weird. But anyway, let's read the case. So it seems like now obviously he's got a plea deal. Now three years probation is a long time, to be honest, to be on probation, but still it's better than being in prison. It says here, Louis Vert took a plea deal uh, in an assault case involving an ex-girlfriend and fellow rapper at St. John. The Los Angeles County District Attorney Office tells us that Louis Vert pleaded non-contest to court to one count of each felony assault with a firing and misdemeanor injury to a girlfriend. Um, we're told he was sentenced to a three years form of probation, one year of treatment for mental health and substance abuse, which is mad, 52 weeks of domestic violence counseling and restitution and a 10 year criminal protective order so he's going to pay her some money and he's going to basically have to stay away from her for 10 years or he get prosecuted so this is the pinnacle of a toxic relationship because from what i remember britney too to be honest she's not a completely innocent pie because she's always been a little bit of a i want to say of her what do we say sure they used to go to each other online i remember seeing posts from jt which is now louis verse now girlfriend and britney going back and forth and that that's probably women stuff right because i guess women even if the ex is long gone or out of the picture they still hold a bit of resentment because that person had your person before you had them you know i don't know some jealousy thing possession thing who knows but they used to go back and forth with each other all the time Britney would then say some sassy thing about Louis Vuitt still being in her DMs, like, you know, vaguely. So this didn't come out of nowhere. They've kind of had this weird thing going on behind the scenes, even though they've both clearly moved on. Um, but yeah, this is peak, peak um, toxicity because despite them having some weird thing going on in the background, Britney still felt comfortable enough to prosecute because usually when somebody's been in a relationship with somebody, it happens a lot when you hear people doing some other madnesses. It's usually hard to prosecute because, you know, there's love there. So unless they are willing to file charges or, you know, go on the stand or whatnot, nothing's going to happen. Maybe this is different because it might be the, what you call it, district attorney bringing the charges to him as opposed to Brittany Renner filing things. But there's a picture of her talking and giving a statement to the police. So it looks like she clearly had enough of him and just thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to tell. So this can end. But yeah, crazy, isn't it? 52 is domestic. This clearly somebody has anger issues, which is a shame because, again, I'm a fan of him. Will it affect the way that I listen to his music? Probably not. I've listened to so many controversial, problematic artists that I just don't care, to be honest, unless it's something incredibly egregious. I can separate the art from the artist pretty easily. I've done it all my life, especially considering the music that I like, um, stuff like metal even stuff like indie in the last few years so many bands and lead singers and drummers and whatnot coming out as complete you know pervs and whatnot i still listen to the music 
and the music's good the music's good um i'm not for this moral grandstanding of like burning my lps and whatnot it's not gonna happen lucifer copped the plea deal after prosecutors charged him with three felonies assault with a firearm criminal threats and domestic violence plus a misdemeanor charge and carrying a loaded firearm there is something kind of lame about being a rapper and the first and the reason why you get a felony is because you got physical with your ex-girlfriend that's incredibly lame isn't it or is it just me that's incredibly lame um TSD broke the story. Uzi's ex, Brittany Bird, filed a police report back in July claiming Uzi put a gun to her stomach and then hit her. God damn. Remember the alleged incident went down in Dialogue Cafe in West Hollywood where Uzi Bird jumped out of a Cadillac Escalade and confronted John Lean to physical altercation. At the time, sources connected to Brittany told us she was discussing a business project with St. John when Uzi Bird rolled up and confronted everyone at their table. Some people were saying that this is Cap and most likely they were dating. I don't think that's true. John St. John and Brittany. I don't, you know, just because somebody's. It might. It, it looks a little bit. I remember seeing the pictures of them hanging out. It did look a little bit, you know. Re, uh, rehearsed or kind of plotted or planned like they kind of sent some Hollywood reporter guy to come down and take a video of them to have dinner I guess as an effort to kind of boost their profile but I don't think it was um, more sinister than that really but yeah mad in it Lucy Vert gets three years on probation crazy crazy and not the same level of backlash that you know, Tory Lane's got even though it doesn't matter but you know you get me, you get me, you get me. Uh, what else we got here? I think that might be it, you know. Maybe I should end it there, actually. This, oh, what's happened there? Is it ended? Cool. Uh, yeah, I think that might be because I already can, can tell my hay fever is kind of kicking the back of my throat at the moment. So I've got to do that and get that sorted out before anything else occurs. I should move on. Let's do this quickly. Let's end it here. So. It looks like um, my main man, Brendan Shaw, has decided to come back out and make another statement. Or no, to make some official statement, I guess, regarding the whole Joe Rogan controversy with Spotify and him. Spotify, actually. I say Spotify, as a um, White House press secretary said. So he decided to come out and defend his boy because, you know, Joe Rogan is essentially the reason why he has the career he has despite him you know not being as a uh, good at doing the job as he think he is but regardless um the defense is an interesting one the things that he says here because it feels like this is more so him trying to pat himself on the back and you know demonstrate how cool and interesting and thoughtful he is as opposed to defending Joe Rogan that's what it feels like again maybe I'm reading too much into it but that's what it feels like to me but this is a clip here of uh, Brendan Shaw talking about the whole thing let's quickly uh get this up on the screen here so you don't see too much of the outside nonsense and let's play it let's go you guys have no clue you have no clue I don't fuck with bad people I don't have any person in my life in my circle that is a bad person zero but if you read headlines about certain friends that I have you probably think I do associate with that I don't that's a weird thing to say though isn't it like how can you categorically say everyone that hangs you hang around with isn't a bad person you don't see them every single day you don't see them every single hour of the day you don't know what they get up to in their own free time when that whole Chris Aaliyah thing went down, he was like, I can't talk and started crying on his show. Why was that? Was it because it felt like the crying was genuine? Some of it was maybe performative. Maybe some of it was guilt because maybe he was thinking, oh shit, they're going to come after me next. But it generally felt like somebody that was clearly surprised that their friend that they kind of held up to a level of esteem, somebody they kind of looked up to was doing things that they could never believe that they would do it, it didn't cross their mind even that this guy that is clearly somebody as a bit of a ladies man da, 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 would ever be in a position where he was being accused of you know maybe trying to diddle kids that was clearly what those tears were so to sit there and say everybody i hang around with is a cool guy to hang around with bad people that's nonsense absolute nonsense and again forget the delia allegations the, the brian callen ones also were like they were crazy bro it wasn't like people were coming out and saying just some any nonsense there were fairly detailed accounts of him essentially our wording people and it's like yo like still we didn't get an explanation as to why those allegations are out there no kind of counter narrative there was no like again it's not their it's not their business to do so and you know who do they owe an explanation but there was no real kind of 
grown up conversation about the you know the role that they play in interactions with women in night i don't know just some some something introspective about how to conduct yourself as a man in the comedy scene maybe getting a woman on to basically share her experiences of coming up in the scene and what men can do better there was no growing or kind of evolving or listening in that whole entire thing again listening i know it's a proper cringe where people will say on social media i want to listen on but there's none of that they just kind of weathered the storm and just continued keeping on as keeping on of course sans the joe rogan sort of like stamp but essentially they just kept it on kept going on as, as as per normal nothing really changed apart from you know crystal and, and brian callum being basically um uh excommunicated from the joe rogan universe but to suggest that you know everybody in your social group how they are privately is just wild to say what a crazy justification if any of my friends were actually what the internet or social media thinks of if they were actually that person they dude i would fucking cancel them so goddamn fast and the other point is all that's interesting about if my friends will like what the internet is this is kind of like a veiled i guess pushback against some of these trolls and detracts and people that don't like him but is him is, are people like him not aware that most of the people on the internet that speak about this sort of stuff are made up of fans as well why do they think there's a a huge silent majority of people that aren't on the internet the majority of people that are causing or driving a conversation are made up of fans and people that don't like you but they are clearly a, a group of fans also that are concerned again I, I again as a black dude i don't care what joe rogan said i really don't care it really doesn't bother me one bit if anything like i mentioned before the planet of the ape story is probably more offensive but still i don't care it's not like i'm going to stop listening to the podcast but the lack of kind of understanding why some people will be pissed off about it is weird to me like they're kind of making it seem as if he like had the bad the wrong opinion around regarding trans athletes or something right that's what it feels like whereas it's like no he said a word that a lot of black people in north from a lot of african-american people feel like white people shouldn't say <clears throat> he clearly was saying it to be edgy trying saying it to be controversial and push by lines and push buttons and shit you know somebody resurfaced that compilation that came out a couple of years ago ironically enough i think if i'm not mistaken alex jones actually was the one that maybe not commissioned it but is the one that you know pop popularized that clip because remember when he was going through that little beef with rogan and he started talking about joe rogan's stepdaughter and shit like being mad disrespectful <clears throat> which again shows how much of a cool guy joe rogan is because he forgave him pretty quickly and didn't really mention any of the stuff that he was doing underhand but if i'm not mistaken this clip is definitely from that period of when alex jones was going after rogan <clears throat> so my life's not even funny i fuck with no bad people only good people hashtag only good people in my life out of all my people in my life there is not a better person on this earth than joe rogan no one has done for more for my career than joe rogan well duh that's the whole reason why they're saying that and again it's not like a look how serious he's he's more well spoken and more articulate and more sort of calm and reasonable in his kind of a, even though i don't agree with anything he's saying then he was when he was defending himself against Ariel Hawani. Isn't that weird? Like he actually is speaking far better now here than he was about. And this is obviously because this is miss. This is the guy that legitimately made him. He obviously broke him in terms of that, you know, um, you'd be surprised conversation. But it felt like to me, again, from an outsider being a fan of Rogan, it felt like to me, he kind of regretted what he did when he gave Ro gave Brendan that dressing down and basically told him, retire, you're not good enough. He, f he regretted doing it the way he did it. Obviously, it was harsh and it was clearly maybe a bit unwarranted, but it got the message across. But he's regretted it after the fact. And I feel like, again, this is just my interpretation. I don't know these people at all. But I feel like after the fact, Rogan made it his mission to basically help Rogue, help Brendan out as much as possible to make sure that he landed on his feet and he had a career outside of the UFC so he didn't be that so you know you know the worst thing that can happen is like someone listens to your advice and then it goes horribly wrong you don't want to be responsible for that having any conscience is going to be awful and of course the best way to get him back on his feet and allow him to do the thing that he wants to do was to have him hang around with everybody at the comedy store go on his show a million times i think there was one year where he was basically the most had the most appearances on the jerrigan podcast which makes no sense considering you know how little insight you actually get from him but still there was clearly a push to basically you know get him on that show as much as possible get people to know his personality maybe get to like him more and he can make a career out of it so it's no surprise that he's coming out and really defending joe super hard but 
This defense is weird. Now, see, that's the thing, right? Oh, the only reason you're anywhere is because of Joe. Sure. Again, you know how many people Joe has helped out and they didn't have my career or they didn't use the <laughs> opportunity and carry, carry it? He couldn't help himself, could he? He couldn't help himself, could he? In that instance, again, in that instance, oh my God, that terrible tattoo of his kids as zombies. Like, I don't know, man. I don't know. Um, that's an opportunity to be quite soft deprecating, right? Like, I know a lot of you guys, uh, there's that common, that's a common adage. Yeah, I'm only here because of Rogan. No, you're right. I am only here because of Rogan. Rogan played an instrumental part of my career. Without him, I don't know where I'd be. I'd probably be holding mitts somewhere in the flipping Globo gym. That's the fact of the matter. And because of that, I'm going to defend him to the hilt because I know this man. I know him personally. I know his family. You know what I mean? Like, I've, I spent a lot of time around this guy and the, the, he's many things, but he's not a racist. He might have said something stupid. I don't condone what he said, but clearly he's not a racist. And this attack that's going on him is completely unfair, unwarranted. And whatever I can do to help and assist, I will. I don't know, something like that. But instead, it's like, do you know how many people that got that chance that didn't be me, that aren't as amazing as I am, that don't have a Ferrari, <laughs> that don't have a mansion? That's what he's basically doing. He's just doing that instead of just being self-deprecating and trying to have some level of humility in the situation. No, Rogan's getting flipping you know bullets from every direction it feels like people are legitimately trying to count which is not going to work really because what's canceling rogan he gets paid out of his contract and you know has to cry into his you know flipping duvets full of cash oh no right but still this is you know he's really under the cost here and this is the moment where you feel like to remind people actually i'm one of his more successful ones that's been on there look at the other people that have been on there they're not that successful as i am it's like jesus man the hubris on this man and turn into something great more more and of course a whiskey at what time in the morning is that like does he film this show before 12 so he's lick it up and ready to roll which is actually good because he actually sounds more coherent than he's ever sounded in a while so maybe it's not the whiskey that makes him sound incoherent he just doesn't concentrate or think about what he's saying most of the time and today because it's daddy rogan he's really focusing on what he has to say more than other people that came successful so that doesn't bother me <laughs> But if I list off the names, black, white, Asian, female, whatever it is, he doesn't, there can be a less, less racist person. Less, less, the pronunciation. Why is he holding his heart like that? He's my friend. Don't kill him, please. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, these people are so pathetic, man. I really don't understand any of this stuff. I really don't get it. I really don't get it, man. They're acting as if he died, like... He says some naughty words. He's getting slaps on the wrist about it. And the interesting thing about it too, again, being a Joe Rogan fan in general, is how ill, I think Rogan's done all right. I don't think his apology has been that bad, really. It's just how ill-prepared everyone else surrounding him is in terms of dealing with a bit of pushback from the things that they say and attempted cancellation here and there. Like they don't seem to be able to handle it well. They're all kind of shaking in their boots. They're all trying to fall over themselves to show how much of a friend they are to him and prove their loyalty and he did this to me and we are standing up to the council mob it's like bro you guys spent all your podcasts talking about council culture talking about um culture wars and trans athletes and trans bathrooms and lgbtq this and ranting and raving about nonsense that has nothing to do with you clearly no one in your life is even you know from those walks of life and here you are talking incessantly about things that you have no idea about and then it kindly comes to your doorstep in terms of the cancellation things and whatnot and even though you have all these stories that you speak about you know from other people going through the same thing like the woman in central park and um the netflix executive that said the n-word in the boardroom like all these instances that everyone's kind of heard of over the years yet they haven't learned anything from it you know the jeffrey tubin thing jerking on camera loads of things have happened in the last few years that you would assume people who talk about this counterculture stuff incessantly would have taken some notes on them like okay what works what doesn't work as in terms of approach how you should talk about it how your friends should communicate about it but i don't know something it's just it just feels weird man they're like they're all very ill prepared and but again maybe because it's the rogan effect because legitimately without rogan so many people wouldn't have a career so they're all kind of panicking because they don't want to lose him because if they do you know what they're gonna do so I mean, legitimately some of them are struggling because he just moved to texas imagine if he's not allowed to make any media anymore do they you know what's that what's that adage did a tree fall if no one sees it like 
if Jurgens doesn't exist, do all these comedians have careers? I don't know. But anyway, here's another clip. I'll play it and I'll end on this one. That's not the way comedy works. That's not the way sports works. That's the way Hollywood works. And how's that going for you? Lame. I noticed it straight away. You see how he's copying the flipping Ariel Hawani um, mannerisms and cadence and way of speaking. Do you remember when Ariel Hawani lit him up? Do you remember that time? It seems like he's doing the same thing. So he clearly watched that video and he's taking notes. <laughs> Look, you can't blame the guy because that was a pretty effective way to kind of get at somebody, right? Um, Open-ended questions, um, presumptions, insinuations, uh, a little bit of snark, a little bit of snide. That's a great way to go against someone like this. And it's working for him because he clearly sounds way better now than he ever has, especially when he was doing his defense. He's swallowing all the time. He sounds much better here. He doesn't sound as angry or furious. He just sounds like he's got the courage of his convictions, like he really believes what he's saying. Again, like I said, how funny is it? He's got more conviction trying to defend a fully grown man who's nearly, what, 50 or something plus years old than he has defending his own self because, you know, clearly what Ariwani said about him was probably had more truth to it and was probably closer to home than what's happening to Rogan. I don't know. It's just interesting. How's it going for you guys? We have the power now. And when the talent realizes we have the power, you guys are fucked. Mm, the fans have the power, really, in it. If people don't buy your thick boy merch or your whiskey, where's that at? We don't know. Or go to your live shows. You don't have a career. You know what I mean? People need to watch your videos. People need to go and buy tickets to your shows. You know, go to your Tough Mudders. That's the only way you have a career. So to say that we have the power as if like, they just walk around and wherever they go, people follow them. Hmm, that's not the case, mate. Like it really isn't. And also maybe to a certain segment of that crowd, not all of them have that power to just walk anywhere and people will follow. Maybe, you know, again, your mom's house people, you know, people that follow Tiger Belly, you know, I could see them following them. I could see their fans following them wherever they want to go. But I don't think the Fire and the Kid have enough juice in them if they went and just up sticks and went to another platform that everybody that was on those other platforms would follow i don't think that would be the case in my opinion but again straight up we don't need anybody we need nobody you guys need us but you're gonna have your puppets that play the game and have to play the game that'd be around for a little bit but we're moving the marker and it starts with joe rogan wow. and we're moving the marker with the guy who's smarter more talented more kind, not racist, and richer than you. Oh yeah, always money, always money. The talent, like again, I love Joe. He really is a thought leader. He inspired me to make my own podcast. I take, you know, I've done jujitsu and mixed martial arts and Muay Thai because of him, because of instruction of he gave me to UFC and MMA. Cool. You know, I, I got into, no, I didn't get signed because of him. I watched flipping Eddie Murphy Raw. That was my first stand-up special. But yeah, still, influential dude. But talented? In what way? He's made a really successful show. One, not repeated in any other realm. Is on it, really? I don't know. Like, let's relax on it. Let's relax. He does one thing really well. The other stuff, the MMA commentary, a lot of people who are more educated than me on that bit say he's not the best let's relax let's relax i mean let's let's just relax and the rich thing of course the rich thing with, with with brendan unless you're not richer than him anything you say in terms of criticisms or pushback doesn't matter i mean doesn't matter you have to be richer god forbid god forbid how he would have replied if ariel was actually rich, poorer than him by a considerable distance like if he didn't have all those deals and he was just a youtube guy you would have seen a real rude side of Brendan, I guarantee you that, but because he's, you know, he's been paid a decent wage throughout his majority of his life, he's had a few deals, Ariel, he couldn't do the whole, like, you're poor, you're no one, you're a loser sort of thing. He already like what you call it, you know, insinuating he didn't respect him because he looked like a dork, so imagine what he would have said if he knew he was poorer. I'll bank on that guy. While the rest of you sit behind your keyboard and your boardrooms and criticize, Cause you know what we're not going to do is go, well, look at what Howard Stern said. Look what the rock said. Cause that's not moving the needle. All that does is cancel those guys. We need those guys. I think rocks a fantastic person. I think the message and the hope that he gives people is fantastic. I root for that. Me 
No, you don't. Doesn't he always insinuate that he takes roids and he kind of scoffs at his success and says loads of disparaging words about The Rock? He's not a fan of him. He's, he, to me, he comes across as a bit jealous of The Rock because he's basically everything that he's not in terms of how well loved he is and regarded and stuff. Like, he doesn't have good words to say about The Rock. This is lies. Meathead. I'm a meathead. I think Joe Rogan has changed the Nirvana meatheads. But you guys must say, oh, the what? What's that word? But you guys must say, oh, he's just this meathead. Is he? Von meatheads. Think Joe Rogan has changed the Nirvana meathead. Think Joe Rogan has changed the Nirvana meathead. Think Joe Rogan has changed the Nirvana meat. It's like he's always got his mouth full of marbles, isn't it? Just. And again, I do it myself. I start sometimes. I rush through words. I speak really fast. But Jesus, nerd. What's that? Joe Rogan has changed the Nirvana meatheads. But you guys must say, oh, he's just this meathead. Is he? Yeah, he works out, man. Yeah, he has a lot of muscle. I hate to tell you, he's smarter than you. He's more open-minded than you. Must. He's changing the world for the better. Silence him makes this worse. If you have kids, and I have two, I have a five and two-year-old. Do you want to come up in a world where the voices that are different than your mainstream media get silenced because they don't have an agenda and can't sell your fucking- Ah, shut the fuck up, man. Anyway, it's bullshit, isn't it? These guys are fucking pathetic, man. It it's like everything in life, isn't it? The, the, the annoying thing isn't the thing. It's always the fans of the thing, right? Like CrossFit. CrossFit isn't annoying. It's the flipping people that do CrossFit that are annoying. They can't shut the fuck up about it. Like beer is nice. Craft beer is lovely. There's nothing worse than a flipping craft beer enthusiast that's trying to tell you about the hops and the this and the that. Go and spin on something, you absolute wallad. And there's nothing wrong with Rogan. It's all the flipping acolytes around him, the, the, the nut huggers, the cock holsters who take it upon themselves to be his flipping, you know, his protector and shield. When really and truly, if you feel like if people were a bit more honest and, you know, he had that kind of normal relationship with people because it, it must be hard again it's rogan too i remember he said it once on one show that everyone is everyone that comes interaction with him is not, i think ari said it to me ari shafir he was like oh yeah everyone i speak to is nice it's like yeah he's like yeah of course they're gonna be nice you're joe fucking rogan and he's clearly doesn't really you know that's what makes joe rogan cool because he doesn't really think of himself like that but he would probably benefit a lot from having i won't say normal but having like people around him that aren't or just flipping you know comedians that want to make a come up because it feels like these people man are just incapable of having uh <laughs> i thought to say they're incapable of having a normal relationship with him that doesn't involve having to suck him off every time let's just whether it's the comments on his instagram posts or when he posts stuff like you know another another flipping cutting board with meats on it like People are whacking themselves off. Oh, you cook me, you barbecue. It's like, look, I'm a fan of the guy. I've listened to the podcast since the high 300s. I'm a big, big fan of the show. Like I said, I like introduced, like I started podcasting because of him, MMA training because of him. But honestly, man, the, oh, yeah, yeah. The fans and the, what, what are these supporters and protectors? It's like, get a life, man. Grown adults, kind of like, he, he'll be fine. Joe Rogan's going to be fine. Even if they do boot him off Spotify, what's the worst going to happen? He gets paid out of his contract. He goes somewhere else. He sets up another flipping platform. You know, that's an actual platform that doesn't, you know, turn into a publisher down the line because they don't like what you say. He'll be fine. Let's relax. God almighty. Anyway, the excellent thing is show episode number five, five, what, two, I think I said, or five, five, three, I think maybe it's five, five, three. It doesn't matter which one it was. You're at the end now. Thanks again for listening. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time checking the show via the uh, podcast apps you know what to do like share all that good stuff if you're listening or watching via youtube make sure you smash the like hit subscribe and if you're listening via the audio you hear a tune and if you're watching on youtube you won't hear or see nothing it'll just end like it is gonna end now <laughs>